Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me start by apologizing that we, I think there's a small mix up in timing. Uh, be that as it may, we are happy that we are here. And I want to thank all of you, especially those who came from out of town. I think there's some people here from Chicago. Um, so let's just give a big hand for those who are <laughs> Besides Chicago, is there another state that Oh wow. my goodness. Oh. So there are people who actually see Russia from their windows. So <laughs> yeah. there, so. um, but trust me, um, this last couple of weeks have been an experience for us. Milan and I have been walking, traveling around, and the sheer passion in our people scares me. The passion to make Boya happen is so real that some, uh, some have even naively set a date. I say naively because it takes two to tango. The decision to go to Boya, if it depended on the governing council, would ask all of us to pack our things and go tomorrow. But we know that this decision does not depend on the governing council alone. I said yesterday or a couple of days ago, I said, if, if somebody barges into your house, forces you out of your house, takes that your house, and stays there for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years, does that house belong to the person? No. The answer is no. Even if the person stays in your house for 56 years, the house is still your house. That's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a situation where 56 years ago, somebody carefully walked into our house practically turned us into servants in that our own very house and has led us for 56 years. As a matter of fact, in the course of those 56 years, any time any one of us made any comment that was that he, he didn't like, he sent you packing. And we have seen that demonstrated heavily in the last nine months. But before I get into that, I really want you to join me and thank uh, Mr. Augustine uh, you have been, you see, one of the things that is strong in this our struggle is that for a tiny fraction, for less than 1% of what they spend in La Republic, when our institutions come on, they threaten them. One of them is called SCBC. The brains behind SCBC have become the, the real heroes of our struggle. Some of us stand in front of them. So, my brother, I want to thank you that you guys are doing an incredible job. You know, when I said the first speech in South Africa, I said first they would ignore you, they would laugh at you, because you don't count. And then when they realize that you count, they hate you. When they hate you, they fight you. But if you maintain your resolve, after they fight you, you win. If you look at our circumstance, they have ignored us, they've laughed at us, they've hated us, now they are fighting us. There's only one thing remaining. The next thing is that we will win. I still remember the first videos I watched of this struggle when it ignited. And the first videos we watched were Minnesota. That's why you cannot allow the struggle to pass you by. When nobody thought of this struggle, you guys were in the cold. This struggle has taken a life of its own. Now, if you guys, if Minnesota does not put its face on the map again, tomorrow when the trumpet sounds in Boya, people will wonder where Minnesota is. But some of us are there. We are very aware of the role you play. I remember the first video we were watching, we say, what are these people doing there? I think you guys were in, a, come, uh, in front of a council or somewhere. They were playing drums and they were state, state capital. And we were like, in the cold, what are these people in Minnesota doing? But guess what? That small flame you lit has now become a tornado that not even Mr. Bia and his millions can stop it. So I want to thank all of you for starting that. 
And I know that as much as you started that, there's one of yours who carried that your flame. It's been burning in her. She brought it to Nigeria at a time when some of us did not know anything about the struggle. And she's kept it burning. It has developed into a life of its own. So I want you people to join me and thank my, my dear sister, Edith Ngang. You have been, you are a marvel in this struggle. I tell my friends, I said, you know, names like Sisiku are becoming the names that people talk about. But trust me, if you ask me, it is it's just a blessing to this struggle. I have not seen in the whole period I've invested in this struggle, one person. If they ask me one person, male or female alike, one person, it has to go to Edith. Her commitment to this struggle is beyond measure. Her heart is in the struggle, and everything she's got, she's poured into the struggle. Um, if we came to this Minnesota, of everything we wanted to do, if we came here to pay homage to this, our sister, because of the sacrifice she's done for the struggle. And she continues to do that. And if I had anybody to say, who do you copy about the struggle? I would say copy Edith Gang. She has poured everything she's got into the struggle. If all of us do just 10%, into this struggle of what this woman is doing. This struggle is one. Because like the Secretary General said, amongst everything we do, and we are blessed, this is the 21st century, they are the social media warriors. They are doing their own bit. But at the end of the day, there's no free lunch in life. And so we came here to thank you for, to get you to see the faces. Some people see me sometimes and they're like, oh, when I open, they see me, they're like, okay, they are still going to see Siseku because I bet maybe we are bigger on screen than we are in real life. So I said, I hope you are not disappointed. Then they say, oh, no, no, we are not disappointed. But I know they are disappointed. That's not the person they want to see. <laughs> so, but the truth is, we all have to contribute. We have to sacrifice for this struggle. So we came here for you people to see Siseku, for you people to see your Secretary General, and to know that maybe as small as we might look, our hearts are in this struggle. I tell people that for most of us who have survived this far, we have come this far, it means we can continue. We're not doing this for ourselves. I'm sure if when I ask you people now, how many of you are happy to be here? Even the best people with the best jobs are not happy to be here. I've spoken to our brothers and sisters, some of them very affluent, very comfortable. But when I ask them a few questions, they shed a tear. Because if God wanted you to be an American, guess what? Your mother and father or one of your parents would have been an American. I'm not a biologist, but the last time I checked, it, an average ejaculation has about 18 million spends. Every one of them will make a child. One of them, you made the earth. The odds were one out of 18 million. That cannot be a coincidence that you are a Santa person or that you are, you are a Manfe or you are from... With the coup. No, it cannot be a coincidence. It means the Almighty God brought you there. So that that's where your ultimate legacy should be. So if we come to America and we are successful, I think the, when, the, when the final call will come and we stand in front of God, He will say, what did I send you to do? I think life is a gift from God to us. How we live it is our return gift to Him. And the question I ask myself is, how are we living this life? Having been born Southern Cameroonians, and then exploring our life, being Australians, Americans, English people. No, that's why we are in this struggle. And I'm urging you people to please reach out to our brothers and sisters, those who have given up, because some, for most, this is just not probable. But if anybody doubted our, our resolve, let them watch what has happened in the last eight months. Our people back home have proven to us that the moment has come. We have never come this close before. No matter what tomorrow brings, as SJ said, the story of that peninsula would never be the same again. And we are on course to take us to Boya. We need your support, financial, moral, and this struggle, I believe very strongly, is spiritual. So we need your support spiritually. People, go down on your knees and pray. 
because the events of the last many months have shown us that it doesn't matter what they say in Yaoundé. The ultimate voice is God's. And he has decided that this is the year that he will free us. So I don't know what you guys believe, but I believe very strongly that our journey is a journey for prayer. And that's why I stress that where we are, this, the deep hole that Mr. Paul Beard dug and put us in, he has to get us out. Because when we started this fight, and this is important because the lawyers and the teachers, they lay claim to this struggle because they started it. But like any tsunami, this struggle has gone beyond the lawyers. It has gone beyond the teachers. It has gone beyond the trader, the teacher, the drivers, you know. This is now the people's movement. That's why the governing council listens very carefully to what our people in the ground are saying. And that's why I urge all our leaders, past, present, and future, if you want to remain relevant, you must sing this song to the tune of music that the people are calling. Any one leader who betrays this struggle, we will throw, that struggle will throw the person under the bus. It doesn't matter if that leader is Sisiko. It doesn't matter if that leader is the Secretary General. It doesn't matter if that leader is Tassan. I don't need to call the names of the others. But nobody has paid a price greater than this struggle. That the person will turn around and tell us that, go back to school. This is the people's struggle. Your sacrifices are nothing compared to the overall value of this struggle. I said it in Germany, I said, Paul Bia has two tools in his toolkit. He goes to war with two tools. One of them is money for corruption. The second one is force. He has displayed the use of those two <coughs> from November last year till this year. It has not worked. However, human beings have a tendency to fall prey to the first one, money. We can see the hand at work. And I'm urging all the leaders in this struggle, all the stakeholders in this struggle must be very careful. If you take the money, and by the way, should you take the money, my answer is yes. Because at the end of the day, it's taxpayers' money. But if you take that money and you act against the will of the people, they will abandon you. This, this movement, this whirlwind that we are in will pass over you. So we want to continue to thank our brothers and sisters, our mothers back home. They have owned the struggle. And they said, forward ever, backward never. When I was going to South Africa, I was thinking, I said, maybe I will go and meet a few of our people there. And I started debating with myself, there could be 300 South Southern Cameroonians there. Maybe there could be 100, 500. My thoughts get, got to about 1,000, 2,000. And I paused. I started debating with myself. I don't know about you, but you know sometimes you, you even argue with yourself. There's a small you inside one of us, every one of us. And I started having this debate. I said to myself, why would we have 2,000 of our people in South Africa? Are you joking? When I got to Johannesburg, the Pinyin population, Pinyin in Johannesburg is over 1,500 people. By the time I got to Cape Town and I got out of South Africa, the inventory puts our people at over 15,000 people. It is a sickening statistic. And if you think that's bad enough, next door Equatorial Guinea, when we were small, they used to call it Fernando Po. Panya, that's actually how my father called it. In, in Equatorial Guinea, as we speak now, there are about 5,000 of our brothers and sisters there. That's a, a sign of how terrible our home has become if you still call it home. We have to claim, we have to reclaim what is ours. And there's no better moment than now. Because you see, for 56 years, we have spent the time criticizing Pa Foncha, Pa Indeli, and Pa Muna. We put that Pa in front of their names. We 
because by the time we knew them they were passed but in 1961 when they had the opportunity we now have they were not power function those people were in their 20s and their early 30s they were young young very little travel experience look at all of you you are in minnesota you've crossed the oceans to be here most of them have read about their stories their only travels were to Nigeria, where they were in the in Eastern House of Chiefs in Enugu. And a few of them had the privilege at the invitation of Her Majesty the Queen to go to England. So when we judge them now, you have to play back the tape. Where were they in 61? Now, if we are blaming them to, till this date, flip the coin another 50 years and ask yourself, what would your children say of you? that you were alive in 2017 and this opportunity presented itself and what did you do? As educated as you are, as traveled as you are, as mature as you are, the odds just don't favor us to fail. And that's why we of the governing council are in this thing, to win. And the only way we are going to win some people say, are you not ready for negotiations? Of course we are ready for negotiations. But the only way we are going to make this happen is that, number one, Mr. Paul Bia has tactfully taken us out. For some people, he's taken us, shifted us out of the, the concern in the first place. Because when we started this case in November, October and November, all our people were out of prison. Our daughters and children were alive. Nobody had been raped in October. <coughs> so we must remember where we are coming from. Now, when we make demands, People say, oh, you are being very hard. Of course we are not being hard. In October, when we started this thing, our daughters and our sons in the university were alive. Our daughters had not been raped. When we got to January, Barista Bobala was a free man. Dr. Fontemniba was a free man. Aya Paul was a free man. Mancho BBC, free man. Penn Terence, free people. We were making demands for something which was genuine and rightfully ours. And what did Mr. Bob here do? To take us away from what we are asking, he arrested our brothers. How do you go to the house of a justice of the Supreme Court on a Saturday and you abduct him? Eight months later, you say release him and some people feel like they should clap. That's an insult to us. That shows you how much he thinks you are not a human being. So when I see those of our brothers and sisters who have been released, and some people think that they should, I even saw a newspaper that actually did a motion of support. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the house slave mentality. That when the house is burning, the house slave will say, our house is burning. The owner of the house will stand outside there because he knows the house is insured anyway. He's going to claim more insurance and build another house. The house slave will enter there and get, bur get burnt because he's struggling to save our house, that house in which he lives in the, the bunker, that house in which he eats the crumbs. That is the mentality of our people. And so we must look at this situation very squarely. It annoys me when I saw the release note. Number one, the case is not close. They are still held by the throat of their necks. If in the next few weeks they don't do anything, Mr. Paul Bia can surely well just say, listen, take them back. How do you get yourself released on such conditions? In the first place, you shouldn't have been there. We noticed how a justice in the same system, six months later, came to court and said, the government is not aware of this case. What an insult. We have never had high-profile people locked up by system than Agbobala and, um, and Dr. Niba. We have never had and Mancho BBC. How do you take them to court every month for six months and a justice comes and says, well, the government is not aware of this and the man is still working. Till tomorrow, atrocities done at Boya University to our children in the glare of the cameras. Nobody had been called to book. So when they go to Kumbo after shooting a child at the back of his head, and then they say, the commandant has been re released. 
and replaced. But if you read the note at the end, they said they acted in self-defense. You have to read these documents with careful meditation. You realize that this is not an accident. This is a plan by this government to show us that we don't count. And I'm glad because even those of our friends who have been arguing, some were saying, well, maybe we should just try and stay the way it is. I don't know how they can say we should stay the way it is. Um, his uh, decentralization policy is signed in 19, 21 years ago. No sign. But even those who say, let's try and go back to 1961, I asked them, I said, how will you get to 1961? The guy has told you he's Cameroon, he's one and indivisible. What we are doing in the governing council is to accept that. We agree. La Republic du Cameroon is one and indivisible. But because we are not part of that La Republic, we will just go away and form Southern Cameroons, which will also be one and indivisible, period. Mr. Bobia must understand as we stand now, our conditions are clear. The experience of January is very visible. We will not have any discussion on this issue until he starts by releasing Mancho BBC, Penn Terence, and every one of our brothers and sisters arrested since October till date. We are not ready for any call, for any negotiations without those people being released. Because when they release them, at least it takes us back to January. It brings us back to where Agbobala and Fontemniba were calling for negotiations. Then again, the lessons of January are very clear. Those negotiations happened in Bamenda, and we know what happened on the 16th of January. So what the next condition we have said is, when we have to negotiate, I didn't say if, because ultimately we'll get there. When we have to negotiate, those negotiations will not happen in Cameroon. They must happen outside. They must happen in the presence of a mediator of caliber, preferably the United Nations, the African Union, the European Union. And we want to call on the table France, the United Kingdom, Nigeria, and hopefully the United States of America. These players must come to the table to watch us make our case. We are not going to negotiate on the conditions of of federation we are not going to negotiate on the conditions of his uh, decentralization we are going to the table to negotiate the terms of our separation <laughs> and I've insisted when those negotiations will be called when Mr. Bia eventually becomes sane enough to call for negotiations when they call for those negotiations if you see members of the governing council sitting around the table, as if that's the team that represents you, those negotiations will not be, will be null and void. It would be an inclusive team from our side. We would have to have Abobala would be there, Mancho BBC would be there, Justice Ayapol Abine would be there, Dr. Niba, uh, Fontem Niba would be there, amongst many others. Of course, there will be members of the governing council there. So this is our constitution. We have already constituted our team. That will be at the discussion. And if you look at that table and you don't see any of these people have names, including the members of the governing council, you tell us that we are not going to respect the outcome of those negotiations. However, if between now and when those negotiations happen, any one of us, including the chairman of the governing council, betrays the cause of these negotiations, betrays the cost of this struggle, that person ceases to be qualified to be in that negotiation. So if you put, turn on your TV tomorrow and you hear that the chairman of the governing council has said school should resume, he ceases to be part of our negotiating team. As a matter of fact, he might as well go and join Paul Bia. On his own side. <laughs> I'm saying this because we have a mandate from our people to make sure we go there to represent our people. And until tomorrow, nobody amongst our people has told us that we should go and change the course. This struggle will be in vain if we change what we started from. It is a shame that we ask for something in November. We ask for something in October. Everything the government has done so far has been typical of the government. 
it's been camouflaged. They say they will open a numb for whatever. Before they even start opening a numb, Paul Bia's daughter got some, gets admitted in an exam she did not write. The one thing we are ignoring in this Cameroon is that the policy to completely wipe us out is a very scaring statistic. We have more bilingual schools in the southern Cameroons than in the rest, all of the Republic of Cameroon put together. All. That is not an accident. When you create a bilingual school, even when they try to appease teachers, what did they say? We are recruiting 1,000 bilingual teachers. They didn't say 1,000 Southern Cameroonians. 1,000 bilingual teachers. If you take that list and you walk down, there will be 10 of our boys. 9,990 9, will be their people because they would have gone to some bilingual school. And that's why a bilingual school in our region is the greatest threat to our existence. As I said in uh, Atlanta the other day, our parents and our forefathers were English in culture and tradition and expression. We now, some of us don't even know, but they will want to make us believe that we are bilingual. If we let this happen tomorrow, our children will be French speaking. It is a very careful strategy to take us out of our values and our culture. And that's why we must resist this with everything we've got. We came here to let you people know how serious this is. Every move of Mr. Paul Bia is engineered somewhere else. He is just, he is an operator to, hand, to do what they tell him to do. But every of those moves is calculated to the letter. The, the weddings of that release note were very careful. Nothing is done by error. And when you read those things, with the, I am not a, a legal person, I'm an IT person, but when you take your time from the position we now stand and analyze everything they do, you see how sinister they are. And the more you understand where we are coming from, the more you get angry with why we found ourselves here, and the more you realize we have one choice and one choice only. As I said, we are on a divorce mission in a marriage that never was in the first place. As we go, Mr. Paul Bia has a choice to accompany us nicely out of this marriage so that we become two very good neighbourly neighbours and uh, nations. Or he forces our hand out and then we become two very unfriendly neighbours. The option today, the choice he has is his today. As they say, you make your choices and ultimately your choices make you. He has a choice to make for that for those two nations today. I pray he follows the voice of reason and lets us go peacefully. If he doesn't, we must go. And when we go, we'll be two unfriendly nations. I cannot tell you the number of messages I receive on my social media pages now where people are saying, you have to tell him that we'll build a wall. And tell, trust me, the essence of the wall, as symbolic as it sounds, is because we know that four years from the day we leave, when anybody crosses the Mungo, the person will understand why we are in this fight. Four years from the day we move, anybody who leaves Babajo, before they get to Santa, they will wonder and say, my God, my God, now I understand. Because this is a wonderful generation. As terrible as our history has been, those of us who are alive today are very blessed. We have an opportunity to build from ground zero. Every institution we had before has been damaged. The CDC is a name. Our uh, produce marketing board, gone. Our cooperative banks, gone. Everything has gone. As sad as that situation is, guess what? We have a unique opportunity in this generation to build a nation from ground up. I have a friend of mine in Nigeria. He's built cities from nothing with flyovers and shopping malls. If he has done that in Nigeria, what can he do in our place? I was joking with a friend the other day. He called me and said, oh, the Republic of Cameroon was beaten in a match in Nigeria, four goals to zero. I said, is that what puzzled you? That should not be what puzzled you. Did you see the football stadium in which that game was played? That was in a quiet bomb. 
Akwaibom is one of the newest states in Nigeria. And that's the beauty of having to build all over. And I pray God, with your support, that when we turn around a few years from now, we'll show our children, not by the scars on our body, but by the edifice we'll leave and say, this is why we fought this fight. I want to thank all of you. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.